Welcome back to ECE 320A. Homework one is due Sunday. Homework two is due the next Sunday. And then we have an exam shortly thereafter on a Thursday. And I have posted material on D2L to get you ready for exam number one, some practice exams. And there's a list of topics. It's essentially material in chapters 10 and 11, single phase power and three phase power. I don't know if we will get to three phase power today, but obviously we need to get there prior to the exam and we'll start with probably three phase power Thursday of this week. <clears throat> Relative to the exam one material on D2L, some of the summer exams don't go as far as what we will go now in terms of they were happening very quickly in the summer. We had four midterms and a final in five weeks. So we essentially just did single phase power in exam one. And that's why I've tried to list the exams that are more pertinent in terms of material content near the top of that D2L material for exam number one. You can use those summer exams, but they may not have as much material coverage as the others that are from pure semesters. Hopefully that's clear. Today what I want to do is just make sure that we're all on the same page when we are doing KVL and KCL with phasers. Now it's not just adding numbers and subtracting numbers. We actually have to add and subtract complex quantities or these phasers. We have to worry about the magnitudes and the angles or the real and imaginary parts of these quantities. We'll quickly talk about maximum power transfer, which really just says that the load impedance, if you can adjust it, you should make it equal to the complex conjugate of the Thevenin impedance of your source. That really only makes sense when you're maybe doing an antenna design problem <clears throat> or maybe some other circuit problem, not so much a power problem where you're trying to transmit a lot of energy to some other location. You probably don't want your source having this very large complex or real part on the source end of that transfer. Then we'll talk about power factor correction, which really is this capacitor typically that we are adding into the system to try to reduce the amount of current flowing in the transmission line to essentially make our system more efficient. And as I said, I doubt we will get into three-phase power, but if we do, we will start with a brief introduction to that material. But we obviously need to have the single phase material very well understood if we're going to start basically tripling this or having three different phases that are 120 degrees out of phase from each other. Let's then remind ourselves of what we can do with sinusoidal steady state. And now we are dealing with, when I say steady state, this means the transients. When you first apply a sinusoid to a system, there may be some transients that start to decay. We are assuming all of those have decayed. If you had a time constant, let's say, of 10 milliseconds, those transients will be gone effectively after five time constants. That's 50 milliseconds. That's not very much time. 0.05 seconds, and then we're in steady state. We're assuming we're already past that infinite length of time of 0.05 seconds. We're in sinusoidal steady state. Now we can worry about solving these problems as complex problems or with phasers. Here's the example that we will talk about today. It's a two load system, Z1 and Z2. We have our source voltage, V sub G, 
All of these are phasor quantities. Z1 and Z2 can be complex impedances, which means that they may be made up of R's, L's, and C's all lumped into Z1 and R, L's, and C's all lumped into Z sub 2. We want to now find essentially some unknown quantity in this system given particular information with that circuit. For example, suppose that somebody gives you the following description, and I was talking about word problems last time. I'm going to make this into a word problem, but then you'll have to extract out the information. Suppose in this particular example, where we have a series connection of two loads, suppose that we know the magnitude of the second voltage drop, and let's assume that that's in RMS units, and suppose that that's 40 volts. Maybe somebody also tells us that Z sub 2, the second load, is absorbing 80 watts. And let's say that they say and Z sub 2 is inductive. In all of these problems, don't just assume if they give you one power, horizontal or vertical or apparent, real, reactive, or complex, that you don't have the other. Here, I'm giving you the real power you do have some complex power. I haven't told you what it is. We were joking last time about, are you seeing the hypotenuse? Now we are seeing this flat line, but there is some hypotenuse at some angle. We just have to figure out. Hopefully, they'll give us a little bit more information in order to determine that, that quantity. Suppose that somebody also gives you some additional information. Let's say that the generator voltage magnitude, again in RMS units, is 120 volts. And they're telling us that the real power supplied by the source is 100 watts. And the total load is inductive. And I told you it was a word problem. And the series current has an RMS value of 5 amps. There's our description, or that's the given information associated with this fairly basic system, a generator or a source and two loads connected in series. What you're asked to find now is the phasor voltage for load one. That's what we need to find. Which now, for exam one, if you have a couple of weeks, you may want to take a speed reading course before exam one. These problems might be two or three pages in length 
and then you'll have to extract the information to try to solve that. There's practice exams on the web. You can see the difficulty or the type of problems that you'll be asked to solve on the exams. All right, let's now see what else we can say. Let's assume the current phase is used as the reference phaser. i.e., or that is, what does that mean? The angle is zero. That's where we're basically drawing time t equals zero in the sand. Relative to, let's say, the peak of our current time domain waveform, we're now saying that theta sub i is zero degrees. What do we have? Well, we have a problem, right? Now we need to figure out what, what we need or how to approach that problem. What do we actually have as far as given information? And keep in mind that this is the picture that we have. We were given the voltage magnitude at load 2. Relative to load 2, we have its magnitude. We had its real power. And we were told that it was inductive. Relative to the source, The magnitude of its phasor voltage was 120 volts, and the real power of that source was 100 watts. We were also told if we combined or if we looked at the entire load impedance, let's say Z1 plus Z2, we were told that the entire load inductive. That doesn't mean that each part is inductive. It just means that the net load is inductive. And that the current flowing through that series circuit was 5 amps in magnitude. And we want to find V sub 1 in this particular circuit. And what we may want to do, and maybe what I would do, is I would maybe resketch that and start filling in some of the known parameters on that circuit itself. But if we don't do that, let's now write down 1 way of attacking that problem. We've already said that I sub S was our reference phaser, or that's what we were told to assume. This now becomes 5 at 0 degrees in RMS. Relative to this circuit, how can we, or what are some equations that we can now write? Or what if you, and now if you were in an interview again and somebody gave you this and you said, well, let's sort of just start from the basics. <clears throat> 
I would probably replace Z1 with an R, an R1, and Z2 with an R2, and just say, let me just look at what happens when I have a purely resistive circuit. You could solve that, correct? That's a 220 problem. And now we're just making this source a sinusoid. But what kind of law or rule would you be using to analyze that circuit? You could be using Ohm's law, but above that, and now KVL, or Kirchhoff's voltage law. And that's still valid with complex numbers or with phasers. If we now apply KVL, and if I start in the lower left-hand corner and I simply write down the signs that I come to when I start navigating that circuit in a clockwise fashion. I'm going to go minus V sub G bar plus V1 plus V2 equals zero. That's KVL. Or I could write, well, let me just write that. Kirchhoff's voltage law then says I have minus V sub G plus V1 plus V sub 2 is equal to zero. And I'm trying to solve V sub 1. And if I isolate V1 on, let's say, the left-hand side, now I simply need to know the phasor value of the generator and the phasor quantity or expression for the second load. What was I given? Or what do I have available? I was given the magnitude of V sub 2 and I know the magnitude of the current going through all of my circuit elements. If I now have the magnitude of those two for load two, what kind of power can I actually produce from those two values or numbers? Now you're seeing the hypotenuse, aren't you? This is the apparent power. You can now obtain the apparent power from those two values. Where now if you in this case I sub 2 is the same as the current going through all of the elements, let's say I sub s, we know that complex power expression is true. We can take the magnitude of both sides and realize that the magnitude of a product is the same as the product of the magnitudes of these complex numbers. Well, maybe I, I'll just do that in two steps. And the magnitude of the conjugate is the same as the magnitude of the unconjugated complex number. This is the apparent power. And we have that. We were given V sub 2, we were given I sub S, we were also given the real power. And we have a formula for relating the apparent power and the real power. There is our formula for the real power. That's just the horizontal distance where the hypotenuse is S, we take the cosine of that angle between the real line and the hypotenuse and that will give us our power factor. We take that power factor, multiply it by the hypotenuse length and that gives us our real power. 
in our case, we can put that in the form P2 is S2 per factor 2, or that's now what we have pictorially. What am I really trying to do? I'm really trying to find the angle of that voltage. I already know the angle of the current. Let me find the angle of the voltage and then I can at least have this V sub 2 phasor in this formula to compute the value for V sub 1 as a phasor. Power factor 2 is then just P2 divided by, or the real power divided by the apparent power. That real power was 80 in load 2. The voltage was 40. The current was 5. or now we have a power factor of 0 0.4, which in an industrial setting, that would be quite low. That's a pretty small power factor. But if we now know that the power factor of load 2, that's the same as the cosine of theta 2, which is 0 0.4, and we knew that it was inductive, so it's lagging, we can now use that information to solve for the angle theta sub 2. Just for doing the inverse cosine of both sides of that expression. And the fact that it's lagging allows that angle to be a positive angle. Or Q is positive or vertically up. This now gives us an angle of plus 66.4 degrees. Now I said we're looking for the angle of our voltage phasor. We know the angle of our current phasor. That was 0 degrees when I sub S was 5 at 0 degrees. V sub 2 then, we can relate because of Ohm's law. V sub 2 is Z times I sub S, and we just found that the impedance of that load, theta sub 2, had an angle of 66.4, and the impedance angle is the voltage angle minus the current angle, which says that what's our angle of V sub 2. You could now come down here if you wanted to and say, well, I'm having a hard time determining if that's a plus or a minus. But the angle theta sub 2 is the angle of load 2's impedance. And that's just theta sub V sub 2 minus theta sub I sub 2. But theta sub V sub 2 then is right there. I may be doing this a little bit backwards. You're given, given 66.4, you know 0. I now can solve for theta sub V sub 2. This is now 66.4 degrees. That's now V sub 2. Again, reminding ourselves of what we want. We want V sub 1, and that's now going to require that we have the phasor values for V sub G and V sub 2. Have all of V sub G. 
we have its magnitude, we have the power supplied by the source, we're not explicitly given its angle yet, have we? But we do know the current flowing through the circuit, and that current, we know its angle. And if we know its angle, and if we know this real part, I'm going to do this a little differently, but let's, we could do exactly what we did with load 2. Let me do it a different way, just so that you see it done maybe a slightly different way. What's the expression for the source power complex? Okay, it's VI star, isn't it? Where the voltage is our source voltage as a phasor, and it's our current phasor conjugated. If we wrote that into its component parts, meaning magnitude and angle, we would have the magnitude of our voltage phasor at its angle, let's say theta sub let me designate that as the voltage phasor of our source angle. And I sub S. And what's this angle in terms of theta sub I sub S? This is now minus because of the complex conjugate. If we knew the angle of our current, then we negate that to get the conjugate. That's all I've said here. Now we can combine or form the product of the magnitudes. We can combine the angles. The magnitudes just go as the product of those magnitudes and the angles I just sum. And this particular angle you could think of as this e to the j theta v sub s minus theta sub i sub s. That angle sign with an angle in it is really a shorthand for e to the j theta or e to the j x if you have the angle of x. And from this we can apply Euler, which e to the jx is cosine x plus j sine x. And that will allow us now to find the two component parts of the complex power of our source. Where now we have v sub s magnitude, i sub s magnitude, cosine of theta v sub s minus theta i sub s plus j sine theta v sub s minus theta i sub s. There is just applying Euler. And if I identify or I separate that out into its real part and its imaginary part, That's now the power of the source, the real part, plus J times the reactive part of that source. And I've just derived the formulas for P and Q. We were told, so this was S sub S, where this piece is the P sub S, and this should have been J, and this is now Q sub S. Do I have any other mistakes on the screen? Or have I corrected those? Let's remind ourselves of what we have. We were given P sub S was 100 watts. V sub S 
was 120, or its magnitude, and I sub s, its magnitude was 5. We can now use that in this P sub s formula. We have P sub s, we have the magnitude of V sub s, we have the magnitude of I sub s. The only thing we don't have is the cosine of that angular difference, but that's the power factor of the seen by the source. Let's now plug that in. We have P sub s is equal to V sub s I sub s cosine the voltage angle of our source minus the current angle of our source and we already know or we're told to assume that that's our reference phaser. So we're assigning that theta sub i to have an angle of zero degrees. If we keep it in for one more equation before we get rid of it, we now have P sub s over V sub s I sub s. or this power factor of our source is now one-sixth and we can solve for theta V sub s, that's the inverse cosine of one-sixth which is an angle of 80.4 degrees. And now we have our two phasers that we needed. We have our generator voltage phaser and we have our second voltage or the load two's voltage phaser V sub two. And that allows us then to apply those in our KVL expression, however we wrote down our KVL, KVL relationship before. So that now V1, and we could say that that's now this phaser is going to be the phaser of our generator minus the phaser of the second load voltage and that's now V sub G was 120 at an angle of 80.4 degrees and V sub 2 is 40 at an angle of 66.4 degrees. And you could plug that into your calculator or you could do the expansion yourself. There's V sub G, just using Euler's relationship for V sub G and now we need to subtract from that Euler applied to the second load's voltage. And if you do that algebra combining the real pieces and the imaginary pieces, you end up with V1 in rectangular form being 4 plus J 
do you see an angle associated with that? Or do you see this phasor representation of V1? I would say you always should probably be trying to visualize these expressions or these quantities as a vector. Now you just walk over in the real direction, four units, and then you walk north or up in the vertical direction, 82 units. You're really quite a bit more in the vertical direction than you are in the horizontal direction, and what's your angle? Closer to 90 degrees or 45 degrees? 90. It's very close to 90 degrees. This now, in terms of a phasor in polar form, is now 81.8 at an angle of 87.2 degrees. And that's now the magnitude of V1 and the angle of theta V1. Although this doesn't dramatically make the point, but look at what the magnitudes would look like. Here we have a magnitude of V1 that's not equal to the magnitude of the generator voltage minus the magnitude of the second load's voltage, since those two were 80. A lot of times that is much more dramatically different. Here it's not that different, 82 versus 80. And if you wanted to sketch those, V1 Well, that's definitely not V1, but you get the idea. It was 81.8 degrees. It's quite vertical. Let's say this is now V1. V2 was maybe here. And now... V sub G as a phaser was right there, where this was now 120 in terms of a length at 80.4 degrees. This particular angle is 80.4. This angle was the 87.2 degrees. And this angle, relative to the horizontal, was the angle of V sub 2, which was 66.4. And the V1 was 82, roughly, in length. And V, I'm sorry, V1 was roughly 82. And V, V1 was 82, and V sub 2 was 40. And you add those head to tail, and you end up getting V sub G. And it's, I think, clear that you can't just take the length of V1 and add that in the same direction with the length of V2 and end up with the length of V sub G. That's what these phasers are telling you. Can't just add and subtract magnitudes. You have to account for the fact that these are phasor quantities. So we were able to find V1 bar from that word problem in, wow, that circuit, given the information that we were given. Yes? Don't look, or you might get dizzy. Here's the power factor of the source. That's now coming to us from our real power formula. 
The real power, we were told, we were told that was 100 watts. We were told the voltage of our generator or source, V sub G, was 120. We were told the magnitude of our current was 5. And now we end up with a power factor of our source being 20 over 120, or 1 sixth. And if we inverse cosine that, hopefully we end up with 80.4 degrees. Yes. So now you should be able to, and you're going to get a big Q probably, aren't you? Because now the question was, could you actually do your power triangle for the source? This is the real power and the reactive power and the complex power that the source would be supplying. And that should now be a horizontal distance of 100. I hy the hypotenuse is now 5 times 120 or 600, and you know that the angle that those two are at relative to each other, that hypotenuse is an angle at 80.4. So it's going way up in terms of positive direction quite quickly. And that would give you the reactive power, but we didn't need to know that for this particular problem. We could have solved for all of those powers and done all of that analysis if we wanted. Yes? So I didn't quite follow. I thought you said theta sub i sub s didn't have an angle of zero. So in the problem, we were told to go ahead and assume that the current was our reference phaser. So that's now at an angle of zero degrees. That's just an assumption. So we were just told, make one. you need to decide where do you draw the line in the sand for t equals zero, because you're happening at sinusoidal steady state. We decided to use our current as the reference phaser. And that then <clears throat> told us that we could simply always, when we found the current or had the current, angle in our expression, that was always going to be zero. Question? Yeah, so when you have like, for all these problems that you can think of like that constraint, you have to have that reference, or it's kind of like what? The question was, how much flexibility will we have in these problems? You may not be told which phaser to assume as the reference. That's now what you will be having to decide as the engineer which one of these might be more efficient for me to select as the zero reference. A lot of times you actually select the generator voltage to be zero degrees. I didn't in this problem just to vary it up a little bit. But no matter what you select, you have to live with it. You can't be changing it partway through the problem. But once you've made that selection, you should be okay to follow that through and everybody should get the same answer. <clears throat> Your angles may not be quite the same, but their differences will be in terms of when you start comparing voltage and current differences at the different elements. Because obviously, a theta sub V of whatever we found it to be 80.4, if we now set that to zero, what's the angle of our current? It's now going to be behind that by 80.4 degrees. <clears throat> yes, so the differences in those angles of the phasers will be the same. Those absolute values of those angles may be different from paper A to paper B. So now I'm leaning more towards a multiple choice exam. No. Question. 
So now if we were given VG max was 120 volts in the problem, how would that impact our solution? He gave us the, instead of saying that this was an RMS units, it's now in peak units or the maximum value. Now you can immediately put that into a time domain cosine waveform. But in this problem, you would now, where would that impact you? It would impact you when you started using some of these complex power formulas. Here I'm assuming or using the formula where you have RMS units. If these were peak units, then I would have a one-half floating around in front of that first V2 I sub S expression. And my current would be in a peak magnitude unit also. A lot of times it's just cleaner to, if you're given even peak or maximum values for these magnitudes to just convert them all to RMS. You know they're sinusoids, so converting them back and forth is just this square root of two factor. But then you have these formulas that you can use directly without these one halves floating around. But the process really wouldn't change dramatically if you're using peak values or RMS values. Questions? The same idea in terms of working with phasers pertains to currents also. You need to deal with those when we're dealing with sinusoidal steady state. Now all of these current phasers need to be treated, or these currents now need to be treated as phasers. If I gave you This is a circuit with, let's say, complex loads, combinations of R's, L's, and C's for Z1 and Z2, and now you have these two loads in parallel with some current source. If you didn't have all this complex and phaser stuff going on, you could immediately, I think, see this is a KCL problem. Kirchhoff's current law. And if you apply KCL, you can still do it here. It's just you now need to make sure that you're using the phasers. The supply current, I sub S, is now the phaser sum of current I1 and I2. These now have real and imaginary parts or components. As an example, suppose that I sub S was 10, and if that's how they write it, what's the angle of that phaser? Zero. I sub 1, let's say, is 7.3 or 7.13 at minus 52.48 degrees. And it should be obvious then that I sub 2 is 8 at 45 degrees. That should just, no, I'm teasing. But those two vectors I1 plus I2 when added together real parts and imaginary parts those should end up giving you a source current of 10 at an angle of zero. And if you sketched those accurately 
you would get that or see that. You would have 8 at 45 degrees, 7.13 at minus 52, and that's going to then be coming back down to the real line at a distance of 10 units from the origin. But obviously, 7 plus 8 is not 10. Right? I hope. This is the new math you're learning, but it's phasor math, and you have to account for the direction of those magnitudes. Let's quickly talk about maximum power transfer. We haven't left chapter 10, so that means we're still under sinusoidal steady state conditions. And if you had a one millisecond settling time, or a one millisecond time constant, what would be your settling time? five milliseconds. So you don't have to wait very long until you're in sinusoidal steady state. If you now are in sinusoidal steady state, for maximum power transfer, you're actually matching the load impedance with the source impedance, and the matching is in a special way. You actually take the complex conjugate of your source impedance and set that equal to your load impedance if you have the liberty of selecting that load impedance. And this is useful, as I said, maybe not so much in a power setting, but in communications or sensing environments. This might be useful to give you the most efficient power transfer, let's say, between your source and your load. Useful for communications. and sensing environments. It is not really what you are looking for. in moving large blocks of power. You're probably not wanting to apply this particular relationship. The reason is, if you look at this, you actually lose half of your real power in the source and half of your power in the load. And you do not want, in a power setting, you do not want half of your power consumed on the source side of the terminals. We won't spend much more time on that. I will refer you to section 6 in chapter 10, but essentially what you are looking at diagrammatically is you now have this source voltage, 
you have the Thevenin impedance of that source, Z Thevenin, and here, let's say, are the terminals between the source and the load. Now what you're saying is you want to, in order to transfer the maximum amount of power, you want that load, Z sub L, to be related to Z Thevenin in this special way. You want Z sub L to be the complex conjugate of Z Thevenin. for maximum power transfer. And again, this is maybe more useful if you're designing a sensor or a system that will incorporate sensors or maybe you're working in a communications environment. But in a power setting, you probably don't want that much real power absorbed on the source side of your terminals. You want very little resistance, let's say, in that internal source system. Let's now go into the last topic of Chapter 10 that we will focus on before moving into Chapter 11, which is power factor correction. So if we don't want to lose that much power in the transmission line, this might be a useful concept. Suppose that we have two loads, load one is, has a real power of 48 kilowatts, it has a power factor of 0 0.6 and let's say that power factor is lagging. Suppose we have a second load that has a real power of 24 kilowatts. How many homes does that represent? 24. I told you this is the new math. It's pretty challenging. But see, we're, we're learning. And the first load, you could say, oh, that's 48 home subdivision. The other one's a 24 home subdivision. And maybe, ooh, load one maybe has an industrial facility in it because it has a pretty small power factor. And let's say this one is actually leading. What we're wanting to do, suppose that we're now supplying these two loads, the voltage V sub G of 500 volts RMS. And this will become important when we need to compute the capacitor value, we need to know what frequency we're operating at. We're in the United States, so we're assuming this is a 60 hertz system, or 377 radians per second. We now have this supply current, or generator current, I sub G, that's supplying I sub 1, or the current in load 1, and the current in load 2. What we want to do, actually, is maybe reduce this I sub G by maybe somebody sitting out here, and this is actually one industrial facility, and they have part of their plant they're saying is load one, another part is load two, and they say, wow, the power company is really going to hit us hard with the bill because of that small power factor of 0.6. Can we, as a company, put in a capacitor, have a capacitor bank to try to make this net load of all three, load one, load two, and this corrective capacitor, can we introduce that capacitor such that 
the effective load impedance is much more rea or much more real in behavior. Can we get rid of these reactive components? If this is a capacitor, what is its impedance? Z sub C. If we just lumped it all into one capacitor, what's the formula for the impedance of a capacitor? 1 over J omega C. We want to now try to find C in order maybe to make those three pieces, load 1, load 2, and that capacitor, appear purely resistive. Obviously, they are not resistive at the present condition without that capacitor. Is that true? Let's see if we can, let's do a quiz. Because I needed a friendly face. Because I know when I say quiz, I usually see a frown. Okay. So now if we have a quiz, oh, and I've been told don't do it in red, it might make you even more anxious. But can you, from what you're given, can you find, you don't have to turn this in, but I want you to find the complex power S1. So this is a hypothetical quiz. This is the complex power of load 1. With the given information, give me that power. Complex. And you can talk to your neighbor if you want, if you think that will help. And this is only for load one. Pardon? Or is somebody just talking louder than the other neighbor? Thank you. 
Does everyone have a triangle? What was your ang or what was your complex power? I'll do the hard part. 48, right? Plus J, and this is in KVA. You could do that and at least get one point out of 25 on the exam, maybe. Right? You're saying the units on the complex power are volt amperes, and I think this power was kilowatts, so it's going to be K, KVA. You know, you're telling me then that you know the real part of that complex expression, and it's 48 KVA. Now you need to compute the vertical piece. Is that a plus or a minus? Plus, because it was lagging. The current is lagging the voltage in this load. And there are many different ways of solving this. Let's solve it without actually computing the angle. But the power factor is the cosine of the angle. What's the cosine of 45 degrees? 0 0.707. We are now cosine of some angle that's less than 0 0.707. So is this angle bigger or less than 45 degrees? It's bigger, isn't it? So now you're expecting your reactive power to actually be longer in length than the real part. The real part's 48. Now you're expecting, because that power factor is less than 0.7, you're expecting that vertical length to be bigger than 48. Just as sort of a order of magnitude argument. What do we know? Well, we can sketch this triangle. We know, whoa. I don't have a ruler, if you couldn't tell. Here's 48, and that's P1. Oh, and I just said it needed to be longer than 48. So I have to start over. How's that? So this is 48. K, this is Q1, and this is S1. And you know that this complex power triangle is a right triangle, and this says that the Pythagorean theorem holds. Meaning, if we knew P1, and if we knew the hypotenuse or the reactive component, we could get the third piece of that triangle. Now, we know that P is equal to S cosine of theta, where cosine of theta is just the power factor. So I can actually find the length of that hypotenuse since I was given P1 and I was given power factor of 1. I now know my hypotenuse is 80 long relative to my real part, which was 48. This piece is now 80. And if the Pythagorean theorem works, I know that the hypotenuse is the square root of P1 squared plus Q1 squared. And if I know S1 and if I know P1, I can solve for Q1. Q1 now is this square root of S1 squared minus P1 squared. And I'm not even having to use angle. So that now Q1 is equal to 64... The square root could be plus or minus, but we know it's plus because it was lagging. We know Q needs to be positive, so this is going to be a positive 
and it's 64 kilovars. It was plus because of the lagging. So that now S1 is 48 plus J64 kVA. Did we get that? Now, what's S2? S2 can be done similarly, except now what do you know about the angle and maybe the direction of Q? Now we're going negative vertically, and is the angle bigger or smaller than 45? Smaller, isn't it? Because now 0.96 is bigger than 0.7. We know that we're going to be between 0 and 45 degrees for that angle. In this S1, that angle that we didn't compute was bigger than 45. Now, if you do the same thing with load 2, We were given the power, we were given the power factor. This was 24K, the power factor was 0.96. Magnitude of our second load's apparent power is 25 kVA. That's the length of our hypotenuse. The horizontal length is 24. Q sub 2 is now this square of S sub 2 minus P sub 2 squared, and that ends up being 7 kilovars, and you told me that that's a negative because of the leading power factor. What's the total load then seen by the source right now without accounting for that compensating capacitor? S2, was it 24? 24 minus J7 kVA, the total power is now just the sum of those two load powers, where P12 is P1 plus P sub 2, and that's now 24 plus 48, which is 72 kilowatts. Q sub 1, 2 is Q1 plus Q sub 2, and you need to do this algebraically. That was now 64 minus 7, or 57 kilovars. What's the apparent power of those two loads combined? It's now just the hypotenuse of that complex power right triangle. P12 squared plus Q12 squared which ends up being 91.8 kVAs. Now what I want to do is figure out how do I maybe get rid of this 57 kilovars with a capacitor. It's positive. It's looking like an inductor. I now need to get rid of that and make my power plant look like all it's seeing is a pure re resistive load that needs 72 kilowatts. And that's where we'll pick up with on Thursday.